Do you enjoy superhero movies? The adrenaline of the action, the arc of a hero's journey, the menace of a villain. Well, let me introduce you to my brand new audiobook, Guardians of the Obscurity, in which I talk about superhero films Hollywood has forgot about. Supergirl, Sky High, and Doctor Strange. You can listen to this 23 minute audiobook for just $3.70 by clicking the link in the description box below. If the price is too much for you, don't worry. You can always use the promo discount code SPIDERMAN50 to get a whopping 50% off. I hope that helps some of you. Howdy folks, Jabariki here, and in this video I'm going to be responding to a patron request. They asked me to review the 2002 film Spider-Man from director Sam Raimi. Spider-Man tells the story of Peter Parker, a teenage science whiz and photographer who has a big crush on his classmate Mary Jane Watson. Peter ends up getting bitten by a radioactive spider while on a museum trip, and the venom gives him awesome superpowers. He can now climb walls, shoot web, has extreme senses, and is full of amazing strength. He uses these powers to defeat a champion wrestler in the ring for a big cash prize, but after he wins, he is given way less than promised by the man in charge, and Peter resentfully lets the sleazy man get robbed, only for Peter's own Uncle Ben to be shot in a carjacking by the very criminal he let escape. Uncle Ben's advice, with great power comes great responsibility, sinks in for Peter, and he dons the superhero identity of Spider-Man so he can use his power for good in the city of New York. Meanwhile, Norman Osborn, the father of Peter's best friend Harry, is being pressured by his military clients to finish his new super soldier serum or they will pull funding on his corporation. In desperation, Norman uses himself as a test subject for the serum, but the experiment goes completely wrong and results in enhancing Norman's more aggressive side. After being forced to resign by his fellow chairman, Norman feels that he's lost everything he's ever worked for. One day, Norman hears a sinister cackling in his house. It turns out that the serum created another side of him, his evil alter ego, and he becomes the supervillain Green Goblin. However, our hero Spidey won't let the Goblin rule New York and must protect the city from this destructive menace. There's an intellect behind this film that's rarely seen in major blockbuster movies. A level of competence and imagination on director Sam Raimi's part, there's a combination of pure passion for the Spider-Man comics and immense talent as a visual storyteller, resulting in a movie that's not only fun for the whole family, but also a deep piece of coming of age drama, a middle ground which is hard to achieve. First of all, the film is a wonderful example of how to do a superhero origin story really well. The progression of Peter Parker into Spider-Man is told at an organically steady pace. When Peter first notices changes, he doesn't immediately know why they are happening. He remains curious and uncertain. One observation at a time is made, and he double-takes each strange new power, improvement, or skill with genuine intrigue. I mean, let's break down the very moment everything becomes clear. Why is a weird fluid coming out of my wrist? Oh yeah, the spider bite. Wait. Am I getting powers like that spider up there? All of that was conveyed to the audience without Peter having to say a single word. Sam Raimi is embracing the golden rule of film, show, don't tell, putting all of his faith into the audience. While Peter does now know that these new powers came from the spider bite, some things are still vague, and it's fascinating watching him experiment. Are his fingers now sticky enough to climb a wall to the top? How can he shoot the web on command? What's the extent of his jumping skills? This isn't just a great way to watch Peter educate himself, but also testament to one of his best traits. A relentless need to try new things and come to constructive conclusions. A positive that most likely stems from his love of science. But Peter still hasn't found his Spider-Man identity yet, and the film comes up with a clever way to nudge him in that direction without the need of contrived force. When he decides that he needs to afford a car to impress Mary Jane Watson and finds an ad for a wrestling competition with a big cash prize. This is a really smart way to get Peter to naturally transition into Spidey, because wrestling requires colourful costumes and a dramatic stage name. Sure, he's not a superhero yet, but there's no rush. This is just another stepping stone. Heck, making it a cage match might put him off at first, but it's how he can discover his combat abilities and what his enhanced body can be pushed to do in a fight. It's all preparation, 
the kind of character development that builds Peter's superhero persona at a good pace. Now, when most films get to this point in a story, they skip straight on and focus on the superhero beating up thugs and rescuing people. But this film throws a wrench into the superhero formula, because like I said, it's a coming of age movie. After Peter wins the wrestling match, the manager sneakily finds a loophole to pay him less and Pete feels betrayed. When he sees the manager being robbed, he feels calmer in the situation, and while the guy maybe deserves it, it shows that Peter can commit the sin of pride, expressing a bitter kind of justice, which isn't a good trait for a potential superhero. When he realizes that his uncle's killer is the very robber he gave leeway to, he learns that he can't cherry pick the criminals he takes on or who deserves to be rescued. He has to be the bigger person and take responsibility for all crimes he witnesses, because letting just one criminal go can actually make things worse. From here on in, Spider-Man is born and we get a fun montage of Spidey saving the day, as well as citizens' opinions on their city's new guardian. Fun fact, some of these extras were played by regular folks off the streets of New York. As Spider-Man, Peter takes his role very seriously, and everything that's built up to the creation of his superhero persona really pays off, as we see him utilizing his amazing powers while retaining the essence of his uncle's teachings. Some have argued that while Tobey Maguire excels at Peter Parker's insecure shyness and nerdy geekiness, they don't think he sells the Spider-Man character very well. And I have to disagree. Spidey isn't supposed to be a typical superhero, he's an everyman in a rubber suit, an extension of a teenage nerd's desire to be confident. So of course he's going to be a little lame and say doofy one-liners like this. Are you in or are you out? It's you who's out, Gobby. Out of your mind. Wrong answer! Not every superhero needs to be as brooding as Batman or cleverly snarky as Iron Man. It's okay for them to be uncool, and this is what makes Spider-Man stand out. He's more down-to-earth and humanistic, someone for comic book fans to relate to and put themselves in the shoes of. This is why we also center on Peter Parker's character outside of the superhero action. Shown that underneath the suit, he's just a regular guy, struggling to find and keep a job, battling his feelings of grief, supporting Mary Jane's acting career, all while juggling his responsibility as a superhero. So, when we see him find success, even if it's a small achievement, we cheer him on, because we relate to his underdog position and know that he's making progress without any aid at all. He even declines Norman's offer to work at his company. Hey, Pete, you're probably looking for a, a job now, right? Um, Dad, maybe you can help him out. No, I, I appreciate it, but I'll be fine. There's no problem. I'll make a few calls. No, I couldn't accept it, sir. I... Like, during what I get, I can find my own work. Luckily, he gets a freelance job for the Daily Bugle, becoming Spider-Man's photographer for the newspaper company. Sure, it's not a full-time gig, but it's a job related to one of his passions, he gets paid to do it, and he can feel professional. Oh, and let's not forget that this plot point introduces his boss, J. Jonah Jameson. Phenomenally played by J.K. Simmons, who gives the tabloid head honcho a snappy delivery and quick wit. It's the role that Simmons was born to play. If we can get a picture of Julia Roberts in a thong, we can certainly get a picture of this weirdo. Put an ad on the front page. Cash money for a picture of Spider-Man. He doesn't want to be famous, and I'll make him infamous. But what's a superhero movie without its villain? This is where Green Goblin, aka Norman Osborn, comes in. Norman is a very serious and straight-laced man, someone who takes pride in being a successful business person. He's become a stern and emotionally stilted man because of his corporate-driven approach to life. It's the Green Goblin persona that represents his repressed feelings, emotions that Norman always saw as a sign of weakness or a danger to his career. But the Goblin sees as entertaining fun. Some have criticized Green Goblin for being too goofy as a villain, but it's important to realize that Norman is facing a psychological duality. Green Goblin has to be everything Norman isn't, or there's no contrast. Norman is a stuffy man who finds no need or reason for humor. It's what makes him so intimidating. Hence why the Green Goblin is so over the top and silly. Even their casual postures differ, with Norman being very stiff and almost robotic, while Gobby has enough of a relaxed nature to hang loose, which plays into his attempt to make Spider-Man feel comfortable so he can seduce him into becoming his partner in crime. Gobby is not your conventional arch nemesis for a superhero movie. He's not trying to rule the world. He doesn't have a doomsday machine. He's just super damn crazy. 
and loves to release Norman's repressed emotions into anarchic chaos. All while being weaponized with military-grade technology, the very same gadgets that his peers refuse to support or fund. The way Willem Dafoe plays Norman's dueling personalities is beyond fascinating to watch. He slides between the menace of Gobby and the vulnerable, confused Norman with so much ease that we buy that we are seeing an authentic psychological split. You killed them. We killed them. We? Remember? A little accident in the laboratory. Performance enhancers. Bingo. As the film goes on, we become uncertain who Norman is anymore, because these two sides to him begin melding together as the goblin seduces him into the merits of being the bad guy, convincing him that this is the right path. At one point, the Green Goblin has a word to word with Peter, talking to him like a friend, a possible playmate inviting him to his destructive games while warning him that even heroes end up being rejected by society. Disturbingly, Gobby is right, as Spider-Man becomes a wanted man despite everything he's done for the city, all because of the media's influence. Having the villain be right about humankind doesn't mean that we're supposed to support him, but rather shows that there's some dimension to his character, beyond simply being the antagonist. He's the alter ego of a man who was betrayed by those around him, so it makes sense that he can see that humanity can be selfish and lack gratitude. Green Goblin also points out that he and Spidey are actually quite similar, which Peter immediately rejects, but when you think about it, there is quite a lot that Peter and Norman have in common. However, it's how they've handled their lives that sets them apart. It's important to remember that Peter comes from a working class background, a culture in which hopping between jobs is the norm, and adapting to disadvantages is the key to survival. When Uncle Ben loses his job, he's afraid, but Aunt May assures him that everything will be okay. This is the upbringing that Peter was raised in, hence why he goes into the adult world with full knowledge of how tough it will be, feeling sad about failures, but soldiering on regardless. Compare this to Norman, a man who has put corporate wealth before everything, Hence why he risks his very life to secure funding for his project. He's too stubborn to admit failure. He's terrified of failing, even. Then, he suddenly faces the heavy hammer of being kicked out of his own company. Instead of adapting to change, Norman is stricken with fear, rage, and resentment, making him the perfect prey for the Green Goblin alter ego. This film really does champion working class values, which is quite a rarity for Hollywood blockbusters, as these are films that are created within the vacuum of a capitalist industry, each production heavily controlled by those who would relate more to Norman Osborn than the Parker family. Peter also sees Norman as sort of a father figure, a position that Norman offers with open arms, cruelly appreciating Peter's success more than his own son's right in front of him. It's not the first time I've been proven wrong. Congratulations. Peter, the science award. That's terrific. Yeah. An aspect of the film I truly love is how these two discover each other's secret personas and how they're actually sworn enemies. After Green Goblin and Spider-Man end up in a violent fight, Peter gets himself cut by one of Gobby's gadgets. Then, at a Thanksgiving dinner, Norman starts to clue in on what's happening in a cleverly nuanced series of epiphanies. First, while checking Peter's room to see if he's home, Norman notices fresh blood splashing onto Peter's bedroom floor. A keen observation may be made possible by the serum's enhancements. And when he looks up, he concludes that Spidey was here. But he doesn't jump to thinking Peter is Spider-Man, just that he was present a moment ago. It's only during dinner, when Norman notices the slash on Peter's arm, that he puts two and two together. Norman loved Peter like a son, so he feels both betrayed and terrified that he now has to kill him. This is all shown on his face alone. It's amazing. But the way things click for Peter is just as masterfully told. When Green Goblin attacks Aunt May, now knowing who Spidey really is, he relishes in her fear with sick joy. Just scaring her is enough to affect her elderly health. In hospital, Aunt May doesn't just blatantly shout, I was attacked by the Green Goblin! because that would be unnatural exposition. But rather, she expresses a sheer fear of the supervillain's haunting eyes. And this is enough to make Pete realize that Green Goblin not only knows who he is, but also has the upper hand with this new knowledge. 
and simply frightening Peter's family is enough to get Spidey to know the message. Sometimes saying less is actually saying quite a lot. Other characters are weaved into the story, each with their own plots that are neatly tied into Peter's life. Mary Jane isn't your average love interest character, mainly because she's more than Peter's crush and Spider-Man's damsel in distress. She's a fleshed out character with her own story playing out in the background of the superhero saga. Being raised in an abusive household pushed MJ to try and fit in with the popular crowd at school and date the star athlete Flash Thompson but only because she wanted to cover up her scars from her peers. Disguising her pain with the facade of being a healthy, happy teenager, Flash treats MJ like a piece of meat, all while displaying red flag behavior in front of her. After breaking up with Flash, MJ starts dating Harry, who only sees MJ as the pretty girlfriend he can show off to his strict father, so he can finally get daddy's approval, even if it means disrespecting her. Why didn't you wear the black dress? Just, I wanted to impress my father. After graduating, she has to abandon the safety net of high school popularity and go out into the real world, meaning that she has to get a waitressing job, even though her dream is to become an actress. And her fear of what Harry will think of this makes her ashamed of her career position. It's only Peter himself who knows the real MJ, her true inner beauty, because he sees value beyond her pretty looks. From believing in her potential to become a famous actress, to respecting that her waitressing job is nothing to be embarrassed about, as he himself knows the hardships of job hunting. However, she's also smitten by Spider-Man, who rescues her several times. She most likely feels attracted to him because he's a mysterious masked hero who gives worth to her life and is there for her more than her own boyfriends. This all leads to one of the most memorable screen kisses of all time. Which I agree is super romantic and sexy, but is still technically cheating on Harry. It's also a clever way to set up how Mary Jane works out that maybe Peter is Spider-Man after she kisses Peter. It's only when MJ asks Peter to tell her what he said to Spider-Man when he asks what he thought of her, that he can finally pour his heart out. When you look in her eyes, and she's looking back in yours, Everything feels not quite normal because you feel stronger and weaker at the same time. This isn't just a huge step forward for the hugely shy and unconfident Peter, but also a healing experience for the damaged Mary Jane, hearing someone compliment and praise her for the first ever time. However, after Green Goblin puts Mary Jane in danger, knowing how important she is to Spidey, Peter has to accept that letting people get close to him will make them vulnerable to supervillains who discover his true identity. So when MJ finally admits that she has feelings for Peter, he has to turn her down for her safety, which is heartbreaking to watch, painful even. This is a woman who has been with the wrong man countless times hurt by everyone who supposedly loved her. And after finally meeting someone who treats her with respect and genuine adoration, she's pushed away. It's so sad. Harry Osborn is a very insecure adolescent, intimidated by his father to the point where he'll do anything to please him, even at the cost of others' dignity, refusing to accept that his dad is a toxic parent who makes him feel small about himself. He's not as smart or creative as Peter, but also not cool enough to fit in with the popular crowd which puts a daunting uncertainty in his confidence, to the point where his ego is so fragile that he can become jealous at the drop of a hat, even of Spider-Man. Instead of standing up to his dad and finding his own self-worth, he brings others down, which is quite common for abuse victims, or he defends his dad to the point where he comes off as deluded. So, when he assumes that Spider-Man killed Norman, he is filled with rage, stubborn to the truth and so clouded by his dad's imposing impression on him that he ignores the possibility that maybe his father was the real villain. Instead of using his grief to inspire self-change or a righteous cause, like Peter, Harry translates his negative feelings into a raw desire for revenge, foreshadowing a possible life of villainy for the young man. Now, I can't review a superhero movie without talking about the action. What I love about the physical conflicts in this movie is that they're a little cartoony, but also high octane, and even a little violent for a family film. This makes the fights dynamically frenetic, with each attack looking authentically harsh or painful, 
punch or kick impacts are rough and forceful, plus the goblins' gadgets can be alarmingly scary. Heck, when Norman and Peter have their final confrontation, it's the most visceral part of the film, with all pop colours stripped away, masks torn apart and costumes soaked in blood. It shows that the film is willing to be quite dark for a kid-friendly comic book movie. And let's not forget the brutal way in which Norman accidentally kills himself, with his last words to Peter being, Peter. Don't tell Harry. <laughs> indicating that a big part of him did actually care about what his son thought of him. To conclude, I love this film, I really do. Sure, it doesn't redefine superhero movies, but it was a breath of fresh air for audiences at the time, after the genre hit a fatigue in the 90s. It's a tightly paced movie that weaves its plots together naturally, using imaginative visual storytelling, solid character development, and immensely gripping fight choreography, to convey a deeply emotional and highly entertaining coming-of-age action film. I enjoyed this movie a lot as a kid, but I appreciated it even more as an adult, after finding new depth behind its creative intentions and dramatic subtext. I totally think it deserves to be applauded for everything it pulls off. This all makes me very eager to revisit Spider-Man 2, which I hope to cover for a Puppet Panic episode someday. I've been Jamboreek and I hope you enjoyed this review. If you did, then feel free to like, subscribe and share. Come to think of it, a spider bit me this morning. Perhaps I have powers. Go Web, go! Wanna be Spider-Man?